Got him. Little kids love following me around. Got a lot of work. Let's go. All right, I got a little shadow. They just love following me around. So right now we got uh, field uh, drip irrigation testing right now. This is a, a thinner line than we're used to using. We have some of the thicker ones, so it's just one inch and it's every 30 centimeters. So right now we're just turning it on and testing and then back filling in our rows before we lay down the mulch and plastic. And that'll give it a chance to allow us to spray more microbials. The soil looks really good. I haven't seen too many issues with it. So it's looking uh, pretty interesting. But one of the challenges that we have is that uh, physerium wilt is uh, kind of a thing around this area. Uh, learned that kind of after a while. So that means that it's in our water supply. And if it's in our water supply, that makes it really tough to uh, farm because if it's in your water supply, you're clearing it out of your field, you're uh, inoculating your field, and then your water, when you feed it every day, uh, carries <laughs> the bacteria. So that's one of the interesting things that I learned recently. So right now we're gonna test this out and see if I can fight this. I have a good idea how to fight it and control it this year. And right now I don't notice any other issues with just natural rainwater. So it's definitely not in rain runoff, but it's possibly from ground and or sourced up further up uh, than the highlands coming down to us. So no worries, we'll, we'll talk about that and how we can remediate the soil and uh, prevent some of those issues. Let's go. I love seeing this when we come back. So this was our leftover Sealy that we had and we haven't done anything really special. But what I see is I see a, a nice harvest window. We're starting to get about a uh, good sun and we're starting to get into that nice window. So I see a bunch of nice little like fingers like sticking up. So this is what a chili plant looks like. So what will happen is that once these start turning red, we pick them. This is a great example of a pickable color to get to market. It's nice and dark compared to the green. And I have my shadow helping me today. So these would be good to pick and then sell into the market while these down into here are for processing. They're already nice bright red. But what I'm enjoying is that I don't see a lot of insect damage. I didn't do anything special with these. I just treated a couple nutrient parts. And so it shows that we don't really have as big of a thrip and or whitefly problem out in the open, which is great. So that means we can proceed to the field and actually uh, attack uh, that problem because that one is probably a, a bigger issue. Um, so right now it's been, it's looking pretty good with our little test plot right here with only very, very min minimal remediation. Sorry, we have our cow. Yeah, that's a cow. What's his name? What's his name? Is it Puppy Jones? Puppy Jones. Puppy Jones. Yeah. <laughs> so I have my shadow with me today. I seem to do this. No one believes me when I tell them that kids just naturally attract themselves to me. They like see me and I must look like, like a giant kid to them or something like this guy must be legit. I'm going to go con him into doing something for me. But what I like right here is we're not having in, any uh, sun scald and these guys are turning pretty good on their own. So it leads me to believe that we can really push through with our field trials again and kind of see what's going on that way. So. I don't see any reason if I actually treat the crop a little bit better than I did these guys, we'll probably get a little bit better yield uh, than what we're seeing. We're still having a little bit of issues. This may or may not be a uh, virus or thripes. That's kind of what it looks like, really, really thin. Or most likely in my testing, it's actually just poor nutrient being delivered to each part. Since we didn't put any nutrient, it means that it's a good pass. It means our, our results are valid because it's our control test. So other than that, I'm gonna go take a look at the nursery and then maybe pick some Sealy today. I'm gonna to take a look at Greenhouse One, see if we got Sealy harvest in there as well. But this is great to, to see. It's good to come back at a good week conference 
and I'm behind in videos. So we're gonna go hit it hard this week. All right, so now I'm not sure if pepper is a little bit more resistant to fusarium uh, wilt than uh, tomato. Maybe it's just a tomato issue. If it is, you know, we're using the same water uh, to water each of our uh, crops. So all of our crops are watered by the same water source. But what I notice is that I don't see the same symptoms of a wilt. So it could be other parts. I am seeing some good flowering continuation. Haven't fed these guys. We're kind of just letting the bags balance back out. We're cutting them back and we're letting them uh, adapt. I am still seeing that we're very susceptible to uh, mite. That's where it kind of gets up top. And we're have to do a lot of maintenance. <laughs> My maintenance together would be just to prune back and then do a good heavy spray, prune out the ones uh, that were bad. And then I'm probably gonna remove the shade nets in this house because I think these plants are ready to go full sun. I've been keeping them kind of like that and it's creating weird anomalies where they're really hunting to try to get above each other, which means they're wasting energy. Now, the good news about this is like I said in videos past, they are uh, perennial, right? Uh, they will continue to grow every year. Now the yield might vary from there to there, but if you're just selling for processing and you can keep your cost low, there's nothing saying that you have to kill and terminate your crop at the end of a season, especially if you're inside a greenhouse. If you're inside a greenhouse, you can grow that uh, indefinitely. I think that you could probably do it. Now, whether you can always hit peak numbers, I'm not sure much to be, much to be desired about whether you can, but from my knowledge and my experimentation with growing uh, these type of pepper plants, I don't see any um, issue with uh, growing them uh, indefinitely. Maybe there'll be a slight yield fall off, but at the, end, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm more worried about looking for uh, thripe. This one has a little thripe or just a little bit of nutrient. Its skin feels nice, but I'm kind of just taking a look at this. This is what you want to see is where you just see a sea full of white flowers. But this is that thing I was talking about is that it's hunting the light. See, it's getting very fan-like and very top light. So it's really hunting the light. So what I'm probably gonna have the guys do this week is we're gonna reduce our shade uh, to each part and we're gonna go from there because that's just gonna be an, an easier uh, one. So we are starting to get some harvest into here. I think I pulled out like a couple kilos last week. This one's always tough because you never know how hard it's and heavy it's gonna be in terms of harvesting because it's a very uh, unique uh, plant and that if you see the field, they were very more bush type, but in a greenhouse, they get very uh, tall and leggy just because of the amount of humidity and everything that we can control inside the greenhouse, it creates a different environment altogether. So that's why I'm really doing this test of them in the soil. Now right now, I think they've done way better than our conical bell peppers in terms of that, but our conical bell peppers did not have the shade net, so they grew more uniformly up to each other as I just randomly grab red fruit. I mean, each one of these is expensive. I mean, before it was like 600 pesos uh, a kilo, so you just add it all up. And over time, if you can continue to grow it, it doesn't cost too much to maintain it, you can grow a lot of the stuff indefinitely. So it's really good. But I think that's one of the issues that I will do. I won't worry about spraying. I'm not seeing any uh, white fly, maybe just a little bit. Is that a white fly? But I really hit this uh, greenhouse pretty hard uh, just to make sure when I started noticing my tomatoes were being very weird. I do think I see thripe. I think I see a little more thripe action in this house, which is going to carry its own set of viruses and problems. But I think this variety that we are growing, it's the East West Super Heat and Red Hot. I think it's actually way more resistant to some of the problems that we're having. So I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna take off the shade net. We're gonna just put it over the pathways only, which is good. So at least when we're under the pathway, we're not completely dying of heat, which it can get like, what is it? Like 40 degrees Celsius, 45 degrees Celsius inside here. So we can get very hot and then we can just retract when we need to. Um, I am seeing a lot of fruit. It's just, we now need to expose it to the sun. And I think that that's the final piece of the puzzle. So now that we've kind of got a handle, then we're gonna bonsai the crap out of it. See what I mean? If you look at it, it really has been growing 
uh, up. So it's really trying to hunt of the sunlight. So what I'll do is I'll bonsai it. I'll prep the rows. Uh, we'll get that moved around and we will just start hedge rowing them. But when they do produce, they're really starting to come in. And these are vastly bigger than our outside crop, which is what you should expect. You should expect a bigger yield from your greenhouse in terms of size than anything else. Yeah, this is maturity. Let's see if it autofocus. Maturity, but that's most likely thripe. So I'm gonna be treating for thripe this week. And normally it's just a suffocant. It's like, it sounds like it's like so, so serious and whatnot. It's normally just a, a soap and a crop oil, which is, and a sticker, just because it will stick to the crop. But the yield is looking really good on these about the size of my finger. Uh, so really, really, really good size yield. So I'm not, not, not too uh, disappointed with it. It's just now getting them ready. So now is about the time to turn the full sun on and work through the crop. So I hope, I hope that knowledge was good. I hope that explained a lot a bit of why you're seeing what it is. It probably explains why some aren't getting as much other than we have constant mite action inside here but it makes a lot of sense of how to get it going and you'll see it these guys will really take off and even though they're fighting each other for space you want them to balance themselves out on their own so it limits your pruning and you see when they actually find like symbiosis you can see that they really start hedging up because these things will produce like 300 to a thousand chilies uh per cycle normally so they can produce a lot and if you're growing them at like 10 to 15 grams of chili then you're doing really good on that so you're gonna you're gonna have a good yield with that so you're just trying to look for annual production type and since we're just about ready to start our heat season i timed it perfectly right to get them ready to go now i just have to do more crop management which is one of the most important thing the last thing i'll leave you with is that crop efficiency what's going to work for you is not going to work for me it's not going to work for anybody else that's why i don't mind sharing all of this information is because it's not secret. You can copy everything I do and you're gonna have different results than what I get. And it's not because you didn't do anything wrong or right, it's because we grow in different locations, right? So you have to really take that into the factor is that, all right, I tested this, I did this, I got this result. Like this whole row right here, this tells me there's not a lot of sun because there's not any massive growth. That also shows me I got a ton of mites and and thripes possibly that are stunting the growth that's why it has those really curled over leaves but then right here they're getting a lot of sun and a lot of flower and a lot of bloom and they're putting on a lot of chilies so you know, have this and these i'll probably just chop out because you want to actively manage you don't want them to keep growing up and growing up you just want to go through and like hedgerow them and then your pepper plant's going to start again it already knows what it wants to do it's up to you to monitor it and kind of feel uh where it should go so yeah it's just it's a lot of, it's a lot, as I drop the camera, it's just a lot of stuff to kind of go over and digest. So hopefully I can break it up over the next couple of weeks with uh, videos and I'll share a lot of the knowledge and remediations that we do and we can watch it together, which is, you know, why I started this channel is that I can share you and I kind of unveil the truth uh, about growing crops because at the end of the day, I think a lot of people uh, don't understand what it is. Uh, I have a great discussion about electric conductivity I planned. Um, just some observations that I've noticed. I think people use it wrong and they don't understand what's actually uh, happening and why electric conductivity isn't just a number, but it's what you're actually putting in that EC to actually determine what your crop's going to do. And I'll show you, I really will show you um, how to use it effectively, properly, not just buying a solution that says 1.8 EC, great what's in it <laughs> what's in that 1.80 c because i can make a 1.80 c but i can make it any mpk i want or any macro or micronutrient inside of it it's all in what you're trying to get the plant to do so i'm gonna i'm gonna show some of that as well and how we actually test it with some practical knowledge so let's go mosey on uh, mini greenhouse let's go check that place out so this is our ingenious way just take a husk of banana, which is not worth it. Provides a little sun, uh, sunshade. And this is going to be calabasca or uh, pumpkin. So really easy. So we're just planting in between our crops and see if it grow. Uh, one thing that's probably not as effective or not susceptible uh, is calabasa. So 
that's just a nice little pumpkin thing. They hold it up pretty high, uh, that's normally our instructions, just to kind of get it. So this is our tomatoes, and I see leaf curl virus and fusarium wilt. So this crop is probably gonna be terminated. It just means your yield's gonna be a lot lower. Um, I see a little bit of blight, but it could be con uh, triggered. Uh, but it has all the signs of leaf curl virus and fusarium wilt all mixed in it. Uh, not happy at plants. You can fight it a little bit with nutrition, but this is very uh, stereotypical signs. This is also has uh, leaf miners. This is a great racetrack of leaf miners. I kind of run rampant on that. They keep destroying the photosynthesis capability of your plant and then destroy your plant in general because it won't be able to produce any more um, things. So, oh well, it is what it is. I wasn't really a fan of Avatar. I like the D-Max a lot better. It just seems to be a lot healthier plant. The Avatar uh, seemed to be a lot more susceptible. They were planted around the same time frame. Um, this one just being outdoors, other one being indoors. This one had way better pollination only because it was outdoors. Its yield, it made really weird looking fruit, uh, like pointy chin fruit. It didn't really do too much. So here's another good one. So these guys were getting water a day and they still died. So that, that, that is your big sign that it's time. This is, this is the economical time where you just kill a crop. You don't, you don't invest any more money in sprayer production. You kill it off slowly. So you still slowly cut back the water and you don't just do that. And then you hawk it up and then you burn it and you get rid of all of it. So it isn't as much as, as we feared. It is an overspray, which we thought it was. We thought it was me overspraying. And that was just applying nutrient because you can always fix a lot of that, that stuff quickly. But it's actually just caused by uh, the water and the environment. The region that we're in apparently suffers from tomato leaf curl virus. And if it's out there in the open, it explains why my greenhouses don't look like this, but my other one looks like this. Now here, this is actually leaf spot. This is the first time I've seen it. That is leaf spot. That is a different virus. That one, the plant can work through. It's not as detrimental as the leaf curl. It's um, still bad, but you can actually inoculate uh, a lot of that and prevent it that way. So this explains why about 10 to five years ago, nobody started planting tomato in a Bosigong because it was full of leaf curl virus out in the open. So you would planted in the field, you'd probably much just be devastated and lose all your money. So at least we know now how to prevent it. We can grow other crops. We can do other types of production, but now we have to go tackle that uh, water irrigation. So hopefully I'll have a plan. Last thing, 95% of you are not subscribed. Subscribe to my channel, comment, share, and we'll see you in the next video.